the recording and we'll see how that goes. Should get a notification. Uh, Supervisor Grijalva, can you turn off your camera, please? So we only have Dr. Cullen. Okay, we're recording. Uh, Dr. Cullen, if you want to start with some comments. I, and Anthony, I'm good. The visual is okay, I'm assuming. Yeah. Looks good to me. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I really uh, do have some very specific comments more than I normally have that I want to share with you. We will be releasing a public health advisory later today. Many of these numbers will be in that advisory, but I want to ensure that we're all on the same page as we move forward. So I want to remind people that the goal of the Pima County Health Department throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is to keep our community healthy, keep our schools open, keep our economy improving, keep our businesses open and ensure that we have vaccination, testing, PPE, layered mitigation available to the community through the health department as well as through other organizations that we are working with continually within the county. As you know, the CDC had a press conference yesterday, released an updated MMWR, an early release. Uh, if you go to that MMWR, what you'll see that the factors that the CDC included in their recommendations are five Many of these should sound familiar to you from the way we have approached this in Pima County. Level of transmission, that is our case rate. Health system capacity, that is our hospital access. Vaccine coverage, capacity for early detection, that is our case investigation and contact tracing. Populations at risk for severe outcomes, that is our focus on people with chronic diseases as well as long-term care, assisted living, homeless, other vulnerable populations. The reason why the CDC nationally made their recommendations, and this is important because it contributes to what you're going to hear from us, is they saw increased number of cases, increased hospitalizations throughout the contract, increased Delta. And finally, the one thing that was reported yesterday that we had seen in some early scientific reports, the increased transmissibility of Delta in people that are vaccinated and have Delta as well as unvaccinated people. As you may recall, there was the belief up till very recently that if you were vaccinated and you got COVID, that your ability to transmit the virus to others was very minimal. That is now changing based on increasing scientific evidence. So what factors are we using? And I will get to the conclusion here to make our Pima County decision. As you know, we've had over 11,000 cases, almost 2,500 deaths. One out of 426 residents have died. We are seeing an increased number of all overall cases, 65 per 100,000. Our, uh, our bucket of where we landed for our number of cases was increased by the CDC to substantial on 719, so approximately 10 days ago. As you know, our vaccination rate continues to be good, especially compared to other counties in Arizona, but it is not where we need to be. Our overall vaccination rate is 52.4%. Um, as reported today, once again, using the CDC data tracker, I realize the data can get really confusing using the AZDHS data tracker. We have defaulted to the CDC data tracker. Our hospitalization rates have increased in the face of increased bed utilization. Now, I need to caveat that that while our COVID rates are up, they are nowhere near where they were um, the last time we had a spike. However, the overall bed utilization rate in the county has increased, not just due to COVID, but because of other diseases that we are seeing in the county resulting in increased bed utilization, meaning less beds available. From a public health response, we continue to be able to do case investigation and contact tracing. We are being taxed. We have a backup system in place with the state. Now, I want to talk about schools because this is a major issue that we are seeing. You may or may not know this number. Last year, between July and July of this year, 4% of our cases were in the K through 12 age group uh, reported to us through our school line. That was approximately 4,996 cases. Since July 19th, in the last seven days, we have seen 56 school cases reported. We anticipate to get another 10 today. We have had eight outbreaks. Some of these are in school. Some of these are related to activities we know put um, K through 12 students at risk, football cheerleading, freshman orientations. 
it's important to note we had no outbreaks in the summer. So we are now seeing this increase as students go back to school. We anticipate that approximately five to 10% of the cases we are seeing right now will be due to school as opposed to a maximum of 4% last year. We are also seeing increased Delta in the community. Uh, July 17th, the last time we have a report that week before that, we had 41 cases. You'll recall um, June 12th, we had one. Now remember, this is random sequencing. Uh, approximately 12% of cases are being sequenced. So it's not overall and it is random and it has a very uh, large confidence interval, which means it could be double that number. It won't be less than that number, but it could be at least double that number. In addition, we are seeing an increase in pediatric COVID-19 associated ER visits, admissions, including ICU admissions, as well as post-COVID sequelae, what we refer to that multi-inflammatory system disease that we actually have not talked about in a while. Because of all this, the recommendations that are coming out from the Pima County Health Department uh, this morning, and they will be in the um, public health advisory, is that we strongly recommend that all Pima County residents, including those fully vaccinated, wear masks in public indoor settings. This is consistent with the wording you heard from the CDC yesterday. In addition, we are strongly recommending all teachers, staff, and students, visitors to K-12 schools where mass indoors, regardless of vaccination status. My hope is that the data I've just shared with you, especially the school data, will lead parents, professionals, paraprofessionals, grandparents to strongly encourage the utilization of mass in the K-12 through setting indoors during school. Um, the other comment that might come uh, is related to the, the strongly recommend versus anything else. At this point, that is what we are saying. We are not doing a mandate. Uh, we are strongly recommending with the hope that as we increase our education of the community, we encourage people to get vaccinated. Please, please be vaccinated if you haven't, that there will be increased adherence to these recommendations. And with that, I will stop. And I'm sorry, that was such a huge data load. I thought you might wanna hear it. Thanks. All right, um, if, uh, if you want to ask a question, use the raise hand feature on Teams. We're going to start with Bud Foster, and then Nicole will be after that. Dr. Cullen, thank you very much for taking our questions today. Goodness gracious, where to start? Um, you dumped a lot of information on us uh, there very quickly. Um, one of the things that uh, is being talked about right now is breakthrough cases. Uh, I'd like to know where Pima County stands as far as breakthrough cases and what do you recommend? Uh, thanks, Bud. Uh, great question. Our breakthrough cases we track uh, routinely. We pull out breakthrough cases from our MedSys reporting system and then we confirm vaccination status. So this data is good data. Uh, we believe it's 0.1% of what we're seeing are breakthrough cases. So it's still very minimal. What we don't know, and we are we have been consistently asked about this, um, an, a discrete number related to the number of people that have been hospitalized and vaccinated. Um, we know who's been hospitalized, that vaccination status, uh, we rely on, and let me step back a second, we don't know everybody who's been hospitalized, we rely on the individual to report that to us. We had a discussion yesterday with the state to try to get more, uh, more discreet and specific data in that case. Um, what do I recommend? Uh, I think independent of that low, breakthrough case, because if you hear that, you may say, well, I'm vaccinated, only 0.1% of people have breakthrough. Um, I wouldn't rely on that right now because of what we're seeing with the Delta variant. We would recommend you mask indoors, public indoors. Okay, the next question is from Nicole Ludden, and then we'll go to uh, Christina Duran after that. Hi, Dr. Cullen. Thanks so much for speaking with us this morning. The latest county progress report, I believe is updated about July 23rd, shows the county is in the red for hospital bed capacity. I know you said there are a lot of other factors affecting that right now. Maybe we're not quite to the winter surge levels, but can you describe what our hospitals are seeing and how the Delta variant is affecting capacity? Yeah, so what I can talk about, Nicole, is the 
the decrease in bed availability we are seeing. Um, we updated that dashboard. I think the hospitalization uh, went to red on Friday, but as you guys know, we try to update it on Thursday. We had a, a brief delay last week. What we do is every day uh, we talk to our hospitals and get a sense of what their bed availability is, including their ICU availability. This has primarily been focused on adult beds, but we are going to move to try to get a pediatric sense also. We also look at what we call EMS offloading time. How long does it take for an EMS ambulance to come to the emergency room and be able to offload their patient so that that patient gets seen in the ER? What we have seen repeatedly in the last two weeks is decreasing bed capacity. Many days where we have zero to one ICU beds reported at some of our hospitals. I need to caveat this. This is not all due to COVID. It is due to, for some reason, an increase in hospitalization in July. And what's important to note is this is usually the nadir of the hospitalization uh, bed occupancy. We usually get much higher in the fall. Um, so we, we are concerned, and that's actually why we moved that to red based on the statistics we had last, I'm pretty sure it was Friday morning we moved that. Thanks. Okay, next up is Christina, then uh, Danelle is after that. Hi, Dr. Cullen. Uh, so my question is, um, what avenues do schools have at the moment in case of an outbreak when they're kind of have their hands tied in terms of implementing mask mandates? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a great question. So let me just briefly walk you through this process. Um, as you know, that we have a reporting line and we also have a school-based team that we have rapidly expanded in the last three days. We are adding multiple members to that group. What happens is we declare an outbreak. I want to be very clear. The schools do not declare an outbreak. The schools report. We, um, If we are concerned about an outbreak, remember the definition of an outbreak, two cases within 14 days that are somehow linked, and, and in this case, linked to that school, as opposed to two kids that are in the same family. That would not be an outbreak at the school. At the point that we are concerned about an outbreak, we get on the phone with the school. We walk through the school in terms of where these kids were in the classroom, was there any cohorting, what, what was that layered mitigation that the school had been using, do we believe it is an outbreak? We are doing everything we can to keep kids in school. If there is an outbreak in a classroom, and I should say this, we have closed one classroom, this uh, already in the last five days, uh, and we are the ones making that decision, not the school districts. Um, then we close, everybody gets the appropriate letter about what it means to be a contact, and they are asked to quarantine at home. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, um, Danelle's next up with a question, and then somebody identified as just LR. Hi, Dr. Cole. My question is, how sick are these kids getting that are unvaccinated and younger? And then the second question would be, are daycare, daycares and preschools reporting a number of cases? Because I, I haven't you know, really seen them in our data dashboard. So I wondered if, if they're reporting to you guys. So let's, uh, thank you for that question. Let's do your first question about how sick they are getting. I actually reached out this morning to a few people, pediatricians in town that are working primarily in hospitals. And what I reported to you is what they were seeing, and I confirmed it with them, that they are seeing increased admissions and increased severity of illness, including ICU admissions. So you will recall, we had this thought earlier that while kids will get sick, um, they may not even be symptomatic, they'll be fine. They are reporting, and these are people that have been tracking this within uh, the Pima okay. County, though all our pediatric hospitals are in Tucson, um, they're reporting increased admissions. I don't have a specific number for you on that in terms of admissions. We can try to get that to give you a percentage, not a specific. Um, and your second question about daycare. I, uh, I, your observation is what we are observing. We are not seeing an increased report from daycare. Uh, you will note, or it, it may oh, have see, been yeah, yeah, not yeah, obvious, yeah, yeah. that um, right. our recommendations are for K through 12. They do not include preschool. 
Um, the CDC has at different times included two, two, what would be that two, three, and four year old. We have not included that because we are not seeing an increase in that, but we don't know if that. Excuse me, can you have somebody else mute? Because I can't get your question. Anthony, can you? I'm trying to mute everybody who's not muted. Has their audio on? Can you please mute? Hi, can you guys please mute if you're not me? Silvia, tienes tu micrófono prendido, Silvia. Hello. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, let me go. I'll start again with this daycare question because I think it's really important. Um, the two to five year olds, we are not seeing an increase in the number of cases right now. Uh, we're not getting reports in from the daycare or the preschools that this uh, that they are seeing an increased number of cases. That could be due to multiple factors. It could be just that they're not testing. We don't see a lot of testing coming in from that age group, but there may not be testing because they're not getting symptomatic. Um, so as of right now, at least, um, uh, we are not seeing an increase, which is why we did not include the two, three, and four-year-olds in our recommendation about um, masking. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to LR. If uh, LR can identify him or herself, please, and then Benito will be after that. Hey, Anthony, it's Lorraine over at AZPM. Uh, Dr. Cullen, thanks for holding the call this morning. I'd like to get some clarification on how the health department will navigate the state law that, you know, essentially puts words like quarantine or contact tracing into sensitive territory and what um, guidance you'll be offering school districts when it comes to, you can't ask about a vaccine, but uh, what sort of guidance will you offer um, in the event that, uh, school personnel find themselves in a delicate situation with, you know, determining a student's health and what's going on, you know, with family, perhaps, if a parent is ill. Uh, this is a great question. And what we are saying is the responsibility for assessing vaccination status, determining the recommendation for isolation or quarantine rests with us. It does not rest with the school district. We are working closely with the schools and we are requesting so a case, uh, someone is identified as a case that that reporting does come to us from the school district but we also have another way of getting it which is through the laboratory reporting to medsys once that is done we uh, either have already been in contact with the school or we reach out to the school and we and we request this is a pima county request the school district is not doing this on their own that we get a line list a line list would be the contacts that meet the contact definition you remember Number six feet, more than 15 minutes. Uh, many of the schools that are open are already cohorting, so it's fairly easy for them to do that. That line list comes to us and we, as the health department, assess whether those people fall into being contacts or not. Now, we do that based on hopefully them answering the phone. And you'll remember that was our mantra in the past, please answer the phone if the health department calls you. We check vaccination status. The school does not do that. The school actually doesn't have access into the ACES, which is the vaccine immunization registry that is within the state. Um, it gets a little complicated if somebody's out of state and they got immunized out of state, but we would confirm that status. At that point, then we make the recommendation of what should happen. Um, we are continuing to recommend that if you are fully vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine. If you are not fully vaccinated, we are recommending quarantine for seven or 10 days, depending upon when you test and what your symptoms are. It gets a little complicated because there's many permutations of that. But I think from the school district perspective, our goal is to say this is a Pima County Health Department prerogative responsibility to keep the county safe and it falls within the purview of our authority to follow up on this. Uh, we are cognizant of what the governor has stated. We are, we believe that our approach to this takes the onus off the school and basically says the Follow-up is due to us. There are letters that go out, uh, many letters in the last week, as you can imagine. They go out under my signature to the contacts and or their families. Hopefully that 
answers that question. Thank you. I have a follow up on that. What language will you be directing districts to use when it comes to masks are recommended, vaccines are recommended? Can we get to that after the first round is ended here? So if you if you put your hand back up, we'll get to that real quick. Um, we have Benita who hasn't asked a question yet, so he's next up. And then the uh, second question from Bud Foster will be after that. And then we'll get to that one. Hi, Dr. Cullen. Uh, thank you for taking our questions. Benio Kelty from the Tucson Sentinel here. I'm wondering, uh, throughout the virus, there have been uh, particular populations that have been affected by the, the virus. I'm wondering in Pima County, uh, which particular populations might be um, most at risk? Uh, thanks, Benita, for that question. It's, it's a great question, um, and we can send you specific data follow up on that. But early on in the pandemic, you'll recall that it was elders, uh, it's specifically people that were in congregate living, uh, nursing homes or assisted living. That population is primarily immunized now in the 90th percentile. So we are not seeing a large number of cases there. The cases we are seeing now are in um, the younger population. Uh, obviously, we're starting to see a huge increase in schools, but prior to uh, some of the school districts going back in session, most of our cases were in 25 to 40 year olds, males, a little higher in males than females, and um, primarily Hispanic and white, uh, probably 50-50 there. So that's what we were um, seeing in terms of vaccination. Um, as you guys know, our vaccination dashboard is out there. We do have census tracts that are still lagging fairly significantly behind. Uh, we define significant as anything that has less than 40% vaccination. We're trying to get them up. Um, many uh, of those uh, zip code, sense, excuse me, of those census tracts, however, are scattered. They're not one or two that you could imagine. We do know the foothills and south in the Green Valley area tend to be have very high vaccination rates. Thanks. Okay, we'll go back to Bud Foster for his second question. And then uh, Lorraine, if you wanted to ask after that, then we'll be good. We got about six, seven minutes left. All right, Dr. Cullen, you ran through a whole bunch of statistics on yeah. schools there. Um, and you said 4% last year were schools. Now it's 5 to 5% to 10%. So that's a significant increase. You've had eight outbreaks. Can you tell me where those outbreaks are and exactly what's going on in the school? Could you kind of clarify some of those numbers? You talked about 56 cases, et cetera. So could you just be a bit more specific? Yeah, um, I can't be specific about the locations, but I can be specific about what we're seeing. So 56 school cases have been reported to us since July 20th. We always get some preview into what we expect to have the next day. We expect to see 10 reported today. Those are primarily from uh, one of the school districts that is already back in session. Um, the out, but they are not solely from that school district, but they are, there is an, there is an increased number, a disproportionate number from the school district that is back in session, which makes total sense, right? Kids are back there, they're transmitting. The outbreaks are, there's been eight outbreaks uh, in the first eight, um, in the last eight days, those are uh, some are athletic related football and cheerleading and not necessarily at the school di district that's in session. Um, some are classroom based and we like I stated, we did close one classroom already. Uh, when we close a classroom, what that means is we said everybody needs to go home. Everybody is considered a contact they need to quarantine. And the reason for that, in this case, I can um, just give you some insight into what happens. We can have an outbreak with two people in a classroom and not close the whole classroom. If we believe that there's been limited action and interaction between, for instance, the two people that are ill and the rest of the class. When we close a classroom, it's because when we talk with who is in that classroom, we think it's more like a ping pong ball. There's kids going back and forth all the time. There's no way we can ascertain that we can cohort who might be the most at risk. And that's when we do that. Um, to go back to the outbreaks, football, cheerleading, classrooms, freshman orientations, 
anything where we've seen a large group of K through 12, and these are not all in grade school, K through 12 get together and have uh, be unmasked and have lots of socialization, that inability to do the wear, wash, wait. They're not able to have the six feet between them. Hopefully that helps. Okay, Lorraine, did you want to follow up? Yes, and now I have two questions. So the first, Dr. Cullen, is what language will you be encouraging school districts to use when it comes to wearing a mask in the school? And are students in districts here in Pima County going to be allowed to have lunch in the cafeteria and play on the monkey bars, et cetera, when it comes to putting large groups together? So um, I will tell you, I have plagiarized the CDC for language. It will be in the public health advisory. Um, Pima County Health Department strongly recommends that all teachers, staff, students, visitors to K through 12 schools wear a mask indoors during school, regardless of vaccination status. Our hope is that this is what the school superintendents will elect to push out to their schools. Remember, uh, we are an advisor to the school districts and they all have their own boards. And so they will make their own decisions about that. As far as monkey bars outside, we will have no additional recommendations at this time. I do believe that we will have additional recommendations related to athletics um, that we are still working through to be specific. Um, in terms of lunch and congregate eating situations, we would recommend and we have recommended that it is best if there can be cohorting. So for instance, if there are five eighth grades and all those eighth grades go to eat in the cafeteria and they all, you know, uh, in a normal school day, they would go sit with their friends who might be in an, another class. Um, we would recommend just from a contact tracing case investigation perspective that there be some attempt to cohort so that when we come in, if there is a case, it's easier for us. Remember, our goal is to keep these schools open. We know that's not gonna happen. Uh, but as you can imagine, the best situation would be if there was an easier way to be us to be able to identify who are the contacts. Okay, Dr. Cullen, can you sneak in one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Christina Duran is next up. Hi, Dr. Cullen. So uh, it's kind of a two-parter. So the first part is like, how likely are there to be multiple large outbreaks at schools? And then come August, when I know a lot of the schools are, are going to go back, and then how big of an impact will that have to the larger community? Uh, great questions. Um... We are increase. Uh, let me answer it this way. We are increasing our school team because we believe there will be increasing number of outbreaks um, unless we have further mitigation. And the schools have done an amazing job. They have all worked with us for the past months, year, over the last year to ensure that they have layered mitigation. We honor, applaud, are so grateful for the schools and the school districts for being our partner here. However, they have limited ability to do certain things. And that's why we believe it is our responsibility to do the recommendation, the strong recommendation about masking. That is the one thing that is different. If you think back to last year when there were masking, uh, and obviously not everybody was in school, people were in hybrid situations and or still mostly online. But as we go back and we do face to face, which is what we want, we're very supportive of this. Um, masking is the one thing that is out there as a vehicle and a tool that can be used by, like we've already mentioned, siblings, parents, grandparents, faculty, staff, the districts to help encourage uh, a decrease in the in any other outbreak. Can you remind me what your second question was? Uh, I want to know how much those outbreaks will impact the larger community. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, thank you for bringing that up because I think this is really important. Remember, one reason we are doing these recommendations, if you looked at the recommendations from CDC, were for communities that were in substantial or high transmission. It's important to note we were not in substantial transmission until July 19th. We were in moderate transmission, so we would not have fallen into this situation. I believe that school-based cases, remember, we don't distinguish. The rate per 100,000 doesn't say, oh, it's 20 per 100,000 that are kids and 40 per 100,000 that are adults. It is an overall seven-day rolling average of number of cases per 100,000. If we continue to see the increases that we have seen in the last week in our caseload, it is very possible that we will get to high transmission. Maricopa is in high transmission right now, which means they're at greater than 100 cases per 100,000. So it's just important to note that the reason why we don't separate out kids' cases from adult cases, from elderly cases, and it's all one, is because the belief is that that reflects what's going on in the community at large. So there is potential for very significant impact on the community at large because of the school-based cases. Okay, I think that is that is our time. If um, if anybody wants a recording, many of you already have, but leave your email in the chat. There's also a couple questions in the chat for from Benito and Danelle. If you want to send me an email, um, we'll try to get those answered for you. But we'll let Dr. Cullen go and and end this uh, end this press conference. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, thank you guys for being there for um, being willing to continue to leverage uh, our insights and our information with your viewers. Have a good day. Thank, Bye. thank you, Dr. Cullen. And when can we expect the advisory? Uh, Anthony, I'll defer to you. I, I'm thinking we're gonna definitely go out today, hopefully. He may That's, have left. That sounds right. If yeah. uh, we get all the uh, T's crossed and I've dotted, yes. They have to correct all my spelling mistakes. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, bye everybody.